You know, I said, I told myself this was gonna be a short video, you know, one that I could get out quickly to capitalize off the interest on Legend Z to A. Look at the length of this video. Just look how, how did this happen? So hi, that's right, I'm the guy that made that 32 minute uh, Pokemon Black and White Hopes and Dreams remake video. And I got completely blindsided by Game Freak, as did everyone else. I'm sure 99.9% of everyone who was invested in that Pokemon Day hype season was expecting a Unova or a Johto title. And we got we got none of that. We got we got freaking Kalos. But for real though, that teaser trailer was super unexpected, but actually super cool. I think it legitimately made me think about Gen 6 for like the first time in about 10 years, not gonna lie. Mega Evolution, we're getting Megas back. And I think we're also gonna get a whole ton of other cool shit back. You know, doing research for this video that you're watching now, I forgot how much cool lore shit Gen 6 actually has, especially Kalos. And if the whole Legends brand is meant to be diving into the mysteries of lore and uncovering untold stories and answering lost questions, I hope Legends Eater A follows in its predecessor's footsteps and answers some of my questions, because I got them and I want answers. Uh, so hi, I'm your host Patrick, and if you haven't seen me before, this is my channel where I normally make videos for your mom about Pokemon, but as circumstances have it right now, she doesn't even know I'm making this. So this one can be just for you guys. And uh, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, or else I'll be very disappointed. And we can't have that. You know what happened last time. So today I'm going to give my hottest, spiciest, most hopefuliest, and of course, most correct takes on what is gonna happen in Pokemon Legends Z to A, given the evidence we have at this point. So grab a Powerade and a towel, because these are the hottest Legends Z to A takes that will make you sweat. Drippity drip, drip, drippity drip, drip, drop, drap, drip, drap, drippity. Uh, so first things first, what the flip? are these games gonna be about? Well, just from watching the trailer, it seems like it's definitely gonna be a game taking place in Kalos, specifically Lumio City. And as I'm sure every Pokertuber has let you know now, it takes place entirely within Lumio City. Uh, but it seems that the game will have something to do with some urban renewal slash redevelopment plan of Lumio City. And that's about all we can confidently say for now. I mean, apart from the fact that it will have Pokemon in it. What a way to shake up the franchise though, if they just don't, if they don't put Pokemon in the game. That would be pretty awesome. Uh, I kid, like a goat, I am kidding at the gates. At the gates. Uh, but yeah, that's all we can say for sure. They're in Kalos and there is some sort of redevelopment plan for Lumio City. That's all that's confirmed. Everything else, ambiguous. This then takes me to my favorite part. Theorizing, speculating, and of course, takes. Now, if Legends games are all about expanding on the mythos and history of a region, C, PLA, then Legends Z to A has some big questions to answer and some juicy mysteries to uncover. So today we're gonna break down what mysteries about Kalos and the wider Pokemon world might be revealed in this game and what we might uncover in the story. So we'll be looking at X and Y and other sources that have built up plot points, story threads, and other general mysterious unanswered happenings that Legend Z to A is poised to answer. Then after that, we will be diving into the teaser trailer to decipher any themes and symbolism it propounds that might lead us to some conclusions about the content and presentation of these games and to see if it'll answer any of my Collosian questions. And then right at the end, I will be giving my most volcanic, most explosive, most solaristic, most Carolina reaper -y takes about what Pokemon Legend Zeta A will do for the franchise. Okay, so X and Y. Welcome to my history class. Funny French region 3,000 years ago. So buckle up and take some notes because there will be a quiz later and you don't want to fail. You know how she feels about those report cards. So 3,000 years ago, there was this big, big hour war that Kalos was involved in and it ended with this big old fella, AZ, the king of Kalos at the time, doing what many would consider a mass unaliving with this big green pointy thing. Sir, sir, why was that a war? Great question, Jared. <laughs> Not normal of you to contribute anything of value, but great question nonetheless. Unfortunately, it's not quite a simple answer. If I told you it had something to do with economic systems and classified, would you believe me? Great, uh, here it is. So this whole war started because when AZ arrived from Kalos, he brought with him tons of gasmos and gidgets and technologies from another time. These technologies made Kalos incredibly prosperous and rich and wealthy. Somehow though, AZ ended up being a hardcore neoliberal capitalistic Andy that let class divide and socioeconomic disparity run rampant throughout Colosian society. Or he was just a feudal monarch that took all the riches for his ruling class, which is more likely, but not as fun. Turns out though, AZ has a brother 
and his brother was a bit of a tanky. And so in a big old disagreement between AZ and his brother, AZ's brother goes and starts a new nation state to start a war with Kalos. Uh, this war is crazy big. And so AZ is eventually forced to send his favorite partner Pokemon Floette out into the battle. Eventually forced, what does that even mean? Like I understand narratively, it's meant to show how dire the state of the war is, but what is a Floette? Like think about this. What could a Floette possibly contribute to an all out war between two nations? Smell nice? Anyway, so Floet ate shit. Uh, AZ is distraught by this, so he uses his knowledge of crazy technology to create a weapon that has the potential to wipe out every Pokemon in the war by absorbing their life force to revive his Floet. Uh, he's somehow also able to capture either Xerneas or Yveltal to power this machine, and then of course wipes out millions of Pokemon to revive his little itty bitty smelly Floet. Uh, any philosophy students out there want to try and morally justify AZ's actions? It sounds like a fun exercise. It's kind of like the trolley problem, but instead of it being one person on the track and three people on the track, it's more like uh, bombing the entirety of New York City to save a dog. As a result of using the weapon and being exposed to its power, AZ and his Floette were made to be immortal and then sent to wander around for 3,000 years in a sort of living with the burdens of your sins trope. And after Floette was revived, floats up to AZ and is like, Yo, AZ, that mass unaliving you did? Fucked up. I ain't never been friends with you again. See you at the gates. Uh, and so Floette flies off and AZ just kind of walks around for 3,000 years with his newfound immortality and bees sad about killing Pokemon. Because he's definitely, yeah. Another thing, when the ultimate weapon was fired, uh, it released this pure life force of Pokemon that it absorbed from Pokemon, uh, which we now know is called Infinity Energy, thanks Zinnia. Uh, and it sort of dispersed that everywhere around the Kalos region and maybe the Hoenn region, and it also fell into some rocks. And that's how we got uh, Mega Evolution as we know it today. Life, life force beam, Pokemon energy, Infinity Energy, then fall on rocks. And that's, that's where we're at. That's it. That's basically the entire ancient history of Kalos. Um, I'm thinking I might do a deep dive series into lore where I actually, you know, show justification for all of this research that I've done. Uh, but for now, just trust me, bro, that's it. That's the entire ancient history of Kalos. But the whole AZ, Collosian War, Ultimate Weapon shenanigans really raises a bunch of crazy questions that were never answered. Like, who the frickity frack is AZ? Was he just some Collosian dude that was shown how to make this crazy technology? If so, who showed him? Is that guy a time traveler? Is AZ a time traveler? Can this man dimension hop? Where did he get this technology from? This for sure needs to be answered. I don't care how. I don't care that Nintendo America says that the entirety of the game is going to take place in Lumio City and Geosense Town, where the ultimate weapon is, is literally on the other side of the map. It needs to happen. I need to know. We need answers. Another thing that comes up in X and Y that begs a super important question is who are all the descendants of AZ's brother? And what did they do with their secret knowledge of where the ultimate weapon is kept? So in X and Y, we discover through the story that Lysander, the leader of Team Flare, is actually the last living descendant of AZ's brother. And we also learn that his lineage is the only group of people that knows the location and the secrets behind the ultimate weapon. So if in Legends uh, Z to A were in a past version of Kalos, I would love to meet other descendants of AZ's brother so they can drop some juicy lore nuggets, extra things about the ultimate weapon that we might not know about. You know, and I wanna know what they do, how they deal with this knowledge of having this massive weapon that could wipe out a region at all time, plus it's green and pointy. Another big mystery I wanna know is where the fuck was Zygarde during the war? Zygarde is like the least explained legendary of all time, all right? We know where Xerneas and Yveltal were in the war. They showed up, got beamed by AZ, and then were basically enslaved and used to power the ultimate weapon, and then they just fucking vanished. But what was Zygarde doing? Running around in his 10% dog form, just licking the wounds of fallen soldiers? Like, what was he doing? If he's supposed to be the green protector of balance in the ecosystem, I'm sure he's not a big fan of all out war or ultimate weapons that create a really controversial battle gimmick. But for real, he's meant to be the protector of the ecosystem, the balancing force between Xerneas and Yveltal, life and death. He should be livid with all of this sudden unaliving of Pokemon that AZ did through the ultimate weapon. Because that doesn't sound like balance between life and death. It just really sounds like a lot of death. So uh, hopefully in the game, he plays sort of Giratina's role where he's super enraged and makes all the alpha Pokemon and stuff. Hopefully. 
that's how that pans out. But the question still stands though, where was this guy? Where was this little green dude during the war? I need to know, we need to know. Uh, some other little mysteries that I would like to know. The ghost girl, that would be cool to get explained. That was a cool side story thing. Infinity energy, how does that interface with the creation myth? We know that it's the literal life force of Pokemon that every Pokemon is made out of it, but is all of Arceus' creation made out of infinity energy? Will we have this story connected to the Sinnoh creation myth? Like, what, what, how does that work with infinity energy? Also, the power plant, not really ancient Colossian history, but like, what's the deal with the power plant? Because I could see it, but I couldn't go into it. And that makes me have questions. So I want those answered too, please. The biggest mystery that needs solving, though, is the timeline issue. In Oras, during the Delta episode, we find out from Zinnia, as passed down through the Draconids, that the firing of the ultimate weapon in the ancient history of Pokemon X and Y literally created a new timeline, a new continuity. So all the games that succeeded X and Y are in completely different continuity to the ones that preceded it. Now, this would be fine if Game Freak put even an ounce of effort into, you know, telling the player what continuity they're actually currently in in the game that they're playing. But most of the threads that even sort of suggest to the player what timeline you're in are in a book hidden away in a library that the player can go and read if they want to, if they can find it. So realistically, the majority of Pokemon fans have no idea where they are spatially, temporally, or timeline-rarily in each Pokemon game. But Patrick, if the games have been like this for the last 10 years and nobody's complained, what's the problem? Well, I'll tell you the problem, Jared. But if you watched my last video, you would already know. Since Legends Arceus, Game Freak has been putting a much larger emphasis on the explicit interconnectedness of the Pokemon world across time and space. Gone are the days when you can simply hand wave away a continuity error just by saying, you're looking too closely. I don't know why I made Masuda Scottish, but... He did really say that, just don't look too close. Thanks for that one, Masada. With the whole introduction of ancestors in PLA and children in the Indigo Disc, their interactions across region lines, along with the introduction of time travel, it seems to me that characters' temporal and spatial coordinates in a certain timeline and continuity actually matter now. For example, Ingo and Older. Their presence in Legends Arceus was never really fully explained. And we definitely didn't get to see the flip side of their space-time displacement. And so the implications that this game left us with is that when we do get a Unova remake eventually, we will be dealing with the fallout of what happens when Ingo disappeared, or the consequences of that in the current day Unova. And if this were to happen, which it seems reasonable to believe that Game Freak is setting up, it would also be reasonable for the player to believe that we're in the same continuity as PLA. But is it easy for Game Freak to illustrate that that for sure is the case? I don't think so. And I certainly don't think they've been doing a good job of it so far. I know, to clarify how the timeline works for my own brain, or the timelines, I had to do hours upon hours of reading Substacks, Medium posts, Reddit threads, watching countless hours of explainer videos just to even understand how the current timeline works. Now we're adding time travel in across timelines potentially. How is the average player supposed to find fulfillment in a story if it's just so darn confusing and Confusing, exactly. That's not a reasonable expectation for the average player to follow all of that. Because, you know, leaving any ambiguities about timelines with the player will leave them with a sense of doubt. And doubt causes confusion, and confusion leads to less fulfilling stories. So it seems to me that characters' time and place in narratives now is really important in the Pokemon world. And as Kalos history is the most major fixed timeline permutation point, Legend Zeta A seems perfectly poised to address these tangled timeline shenanigans. Now before I make any smoldering takes, Smolder. Now before I make any smoldering takes about what's gonna happen in these games, let's add some validity to the points I'm gonna make by taking a look at the trailer release on Pokemon Day. Okay, a big one first. Now I know there aren't any direct themes of time travel in X and Y outside of Hooper and some assumptions you can make about AZ, but here is my argument as to why I think there will be time travel in Legend Z Day. First off, the major aesthetic shift between the beginning middle and end of the trailer. It all starts with what looks like redevelopment plans being drawn up on paper for Lumio City. Now, as many a Pokemon theorist and YouTuber have probably already stated, Lumio City's redevelopment plan is probably a direct reference to the historical 
real thing that happened, Haussmann's redevelopment plan of Paris. This redevelopment plan took place in the mid 19th century, around 1850, which is an important date because if you know anything about Legend's Arceus real life historical counterpart, you would know that that's based on the Meiji restoration period, which also takes place in the mid 19th century during the colonization of Hokkaido, which is the place that Hisui and later Sinnoh is based off. These two events only take place within about 10 or 20 years of each other, which makes a really convincing argument as to why Legend Zeta A will be in the past. And you know what? I'm convinced. But I'm also convinced that there'll be time travel. Let me get back to the aesthetics. After we see the paper plans, drawn up, the video then transitions to a blue neon wireframe version of Lumio City, and it's modern day. Now I'm not saying it's seemingly modern day just because neon blue light not old, but I also kind of am. Game Freak has consistently used this visual styling to denote a futuristic city, especially when it's juxtaposed to something old. Prime example, the last time we visited a futurism coded city in the Pokemon franchise, Opelucid City, literally called Time's Dividing Line. Historic Opelucid, no neon blue wireframe floor, old ugly building. Future Opelucid, neon wireframe blue everything. Another example, Black City, look at it. Look at it. This is a distinct Game Freak Pokemon future styling. Now, I think when people saw this trailer, these two images are the thing that popped into mind. What we see in the trailer is a future Kalos, or at least an alternate future Kalos, different to the one we saw in X and Y. I mean, even if we just look at the Violet Paradox Pokemon, they all, in their styling, and they're clearly styled to be from the future, use these harsh neon light lines to indicate to the player that they are from the future. It's a clear, distinct styling. Game Freak uses these neon lines to indicate that something is from the future, especially blue lines. Okay, it's not only this. Also, look at what this woman in the trailer is wearing, all right? Now, I don't know if you've done this. Search up on Google right now, Parisian 19th century fashion. Okay, take it all in. This is what bichets be adorning themselves with in the 19th century in Paris, all right? Now look at what this woman is wearing, puffer jacket. Ah yes, my favorite 19th century Parisian fashion trend, wearing 21st century globalized fashion trends. This woman looks more like a Uniqlo model than a Parisian plebeian, or just a 19th century Parisian inhabitant. I don't know about you, but that's enough evidence for me to believe at least that part of the trailer is taking place in a modern day or futuristic Kalos. And I don't think it's that far of a leap to extrapolate that that's where we're gonna take some of the gameplay. The trailer then returns to that Manila folder sort of shot, which I think can be interpreted that the interchange between paper, future, paper, indicates that there's gonna be some sort of interchange between 19th century Paris and the current day or future Paris. Sorry, Lumios in Legend Z to A. Alrighty, smaller trailer notice up next. There's this little symbol that appears throughout the video that looks like some people have been saying is a quasar, which could represent infinity energy. I think definitely it's a team of the game, just like the Galaxy Expedition team was the team in Legends Arceus. And I imagine their function as the team of Legends Z to A will be very similar to the Galaxy Expeditions team, you know, moving the narrative forwards through giving the player a role to complete or whatever. What I'm really interested in with this team is that if the game is taking place both in the past and in the future or the modern day, that we will meet more of AZ's brother's descendants. If characters are created anything like in PLA, ancestry is a really big theme. So I'm hoping that we'll meet more of AZ's brother's descendants, Lysander's ancestry, and we'll learn more secrets about the ultimate weapon. Because remember, AZ's brother's descendants are the only people that know about how the ultimate weapon works and where it is apart from AZ himself. We need to know about the ultimate weapon, which brings me to my final point, the A in the Legends Z to A logo. Now, lots of creators and theorists and internet discord participants have been saying that the A in the Legends Z to A logo is actually referring to a new Pokemon, a new legendary Pokemon that fought on the opposing side, AZ's brother's side during the Great Collosian War. And I see you Tyranitar Tube, I love your stuff. Uh, but slight problem, how could there be another Pokemon fighting on the other side of the war that's a counterpart to Zygarde if Zygarde wasn't even fighting in the war? We don't know. So it seems like that's a bit of a weak argument. What I think is more likely, and I've seen be the dominant speculation online, is that the A in Legend Z to A represents 
the ultimate weapon. References to A to Z in media and literature often invoke ideas of the beginning and the end, which are diametrically opposed ideas. And in this case, I don't think it's talking about opposing forces in a war. Rather, I think it's more alluding to the ideas of beginning and end being subverted, new beginnings, Z to A. And I think the inclusion of the hyphen in the title further pushes this point forwards. If it was just ZA, there's no like movement. You know, the hyphen sort of denotes there's a movement. So we're going from an end to a new beginning, a new beginning. So for this reason, I really don't think that the A represents a legendary Pokemon. Rather, it represents the ultimate weapon and almost necessitates time travel. Here's why. Like I was saying before, AZ's use of the ultimate weapon forced the new Pokemon continuity into existence. This new mega timeline creates issues for Game Freak moving forward if they want to continue to create increasingly character interconnected, inter-region, inter-space-time stories as I talked about in more detail earlier. This needs to be addressed. Also, since PLA, Game Freak has kind of had an obsession with storytelling through time travel and paradoxes. When AZ used the ultimate weapon, he committed a terrible atrocity. The consequences of his actions tormented him for three thousand years, which is a huge thing. But we still don't know how AZ got the technology to create the ultimate weapon and other technologies in Kalos, like the Anastar City Sundial. And to make sense of the genesis of Mega Evolution and the timelines, we need to know how he had access to this technology. Here's my hot take. Here is the hottest Legends Z to A take you will hear all year. I think Game Freak is once and for all going to choose a timeline, remove any ambiguity and solidify the mega timeline as the sole timeline moving forwards throughout the Pokemon mainline games. This will be the end result of Legends Z to A. I think it will likely be achieved through time travel somehow influencing or revealing the truth about the secrets behind AZ and the ultimate weapon and how he was able to build it, which will then lay the groundwork to allow the proliferation of mega evolution throughout the rest of the Pokemon world. That's my take. Uh, is it hot in here or is it uh, just me? If you're interested in hearing a more detailed, in-depth version of that take, a more cited and justified version, leave a comment below. I have like a billion theories about how Game Freak could actually achieve this through the story. So leave a comment below if you're interested in that. If there is interest, I will do it. You know, with this whole timeline choosing take, I initially thought that Game Freak was just going to eliminate the mega timeline entirely. I feel like that actually resolves AZ's trauma really well, uh, better than X and Y did it. Uh, but unfortunately, Megas, in nearly every other Pokemon medium, Mega Evolution is a big thing still. Like in Master ZX, Pokemon Go, and the TCG. So erasing Mega Evolution from existence seems kind of impossible. Uh, this leads me to believe that Megas are gonna stick around in the main series as well. And honestly, I think they're gonna expand on the concept, if not only for the reason that Mega Evolution is the most merchandisable, commercially viable battle gimmick that Game Freak has ever made. Um, and so expanding on that means the Pokemon company can make more money. Because you know, I would buy a Mega Evolution figurine plushie of things. Terrestrialization, ugly. Mega Evolution, looking cool. Uh, but regardless of the method that Game Freak takes to achieve this, I do think that in Pokemon Legends Z to A, they will be solving the timeline issue. Closing the timeline ambiguity before the Unova games just makes sense. Remember the time travel narrative set up in Legends Arceus? If we know what timeline we're in before the Unova games release, it'll remove all of the potential problems that are brought up with the Ingo and older storylines before they even happen. It also allows Game Freak to make more compelling time travel stories, which seem to be Game Freak's current narrative theme set, without constantly having to clarify to the player what timeline they're in, slash just don't let them know and leave them more confused, which is what they seem to be best at. So those are my takes. There will be time travel. We will be visiting old and new slash modern Kalos. There will be no A legendary Pokemon. And finally, we will be resolving the timeline issues and solidifying the mega timeline as the only timeline in the main series going forwards. Legends Z to A, a new beginning. My forehead wet, wet with the sweat of these takes at the gates.
Dr. Seuss, call me. But uh, that's it for me for now. Uh, for real though, I love Pokemon lore and theories and theorizing. So if you're interested in me diving deeper into any of my ideas that I've laid out in this video, uh, please leave a comment and tell me that you're interested because I for sure will make some content about that if you want it. I could flesh that stuff out for hours, but um, we are out of time today. Jesus, I thought this was gonna be a short one. Anyway, say hi to your mum for me. I'll uh, let her know that I'm still working on that Riddler Coup video. Uh, peace be with you, and I will see you at the gates.